my quick introduction. I'm Greg Goldstein. I'm the president of IDW Publishing um, and the very proud uh, president and publisher of over 21 artist editions as of today. Um, <laughs> I, 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 at this late in the game, if, uh, if you're here, we're going to assume a certain amount of familiarity and knowledge um, of, uh, of our artist editions. Uh, with me on the panel is Scott Doonbeer, and it's essentially Scott's panel. We'll get to that in a second. And two of the greats who both have new projects with us uh, out uh, as of this convention, um, Dave Gibbons, of course, at the end. Well, I, what can I say about Dave that hasn't been said already? Well, creator of Watchmen and a really terrific artist and great guy. And Walter <laughs> Simonson, <laughs> whose work I have been <coughs> enjoying since those early Manhunter pages, which we are going to be privileged and proud to publish in a few months, more or less, hopefully. So um, without further ado, what, what the format of this panel is going to be is the following. Scott will get up and walk you through the latest and greatest of our submissions including two new announcements or, or just two new announcements? Two new oh. announcements. Without further ado, Scott, walk us through our stuff. All right. Well, we are going to be talking about some artist editions that uh, have just come out and will be coming out over the next few months. And then at the end, we will have two announcements. First is the Jim Steranko, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. artist edition, which um, <laughs> debuted, uh, <coughs> it, ca it came out in stores uh, last week, I think, last week. And uh, it, it's, it's fun to hear the response from people because uh, there have been some large, oversized artist editions of different things, EC stuff. Um, but this was the first large Marvel book. And uh, uh, people weren't quite prepared for it. I saw a lot of tweets um, from various people talking about uh, it's a nice book, but they think they're going to need to see a chiropractor. Uh, a couple of pages from the inside of the book. Jim Steranko is here at the show, by the way. You can get a copy of the book and bring it over to him at his booth. He's over at uh, the Vanguard Publishing booth. And then, of course, the Mike Mignola Hellboy uh, Artist Edition, which is also out at the show. Um, we've actually sold out of the con exclusive cover already, but we do have the regular cover. And this is uh, 200 pages of just beautiful Mike Mignola art. The, the primary piece is Jim. Uh, Oh, right, Hellboy and Hell. Hellboy and Hell and other stories. And this is the Dave Gibbons Watchmen Artifact Edition. Uh, and actually, I'll let uh, Dave, you want to talk about it a little bit? Or should we wait till later? Or wait till later. Okay, wait till later. And uh, actually, that, uh, that page on the left, it's interesting, you know, the little things you see on these, on these pages. If you notice the inscription on the bottom, uh, it's to some guy named Neil, who I think he's written some comics, hasn't he, Dave? <laughs> Yes, a few. Yeah, yeah. A few. No, do you want me just to say something? Sure, sure, go ahead. Because, uh, uh, in fact, Neil was very helpful to us when we were um, uh, creating Watchmen because Alan would have an idea of some quotation from English literature that he kind of vaguely knew, and he'd phone up Neil, and Neil was immediately able to tell him exactly what the quotation was. So uh, before I sold any of the pages, we gave Neil his choice, and that was the page he chose, which uh, of course is really unusual in terms of the book because it's got not only a nine nine panels on it, it's got what one, two, three, four, seventeen, five, six, I think, eighteen, seventeen yeah. on it. So it's a really complex page uh, and a, a really sort of vivid little silent sequence. And I have to say, he chose really well. That would be one of my favourite pages too. So, he, so he was the first, the original Jess Nevins. Yes, he was really. Yeah. yeah. And next we have. The Lawnmower Man portfolio, which is by Walter Simonson, and it's from a story by Stephen King, a short story that uh, was also turned into a movie. Uh, this adaptation is a little bit unusual because uh, it was actually written by Stephen King. Isn't that right, Walter? That's right. We we did it what's called Marvel style, which almost nobody does anymore, but which remains my favorite style of working. And I had a uh, I, I took the story. Marvel got the rights to it. Um, I picked up a copy of whatever book that story is in, one of the early King books. Uh, we did it as 23 pages, the 23 pages, and so I, I just, I drew it from the short story, and then we mailed all the pages off to Stephen King, <coughs> and he wrote the script from the pages that I had drawn, and it turned out he wrote it extremely well. There was, uh, not every novelist jumps right in and does a comic book that really <laughs> sings, and he added just enough detail, including a lawnmower man's name, which is not in the short story, I don't think. Uh, because in the comic, you see him. 
And so to see that guy makes him a character. So having his name and a few other things like that worked out very well. The only thing about it that was really a, a sort of an abject, uh, well, it wasn't really a failure, but uh, it was an appalling act on my own part, is that nobody explained to Stephen how this is, and I never dealt with him. I, I say Stephen like I know him. I never talked to him. I never emailed him. There was no email back then. I didn't do any of that stuff, so it's like I knew him. And we basically, he wrote the entire script. I don't think it's on the pages that you're showing. Maybe not. He wrote the entire script in pencil around the margins of the pages. Like he didn't actually do a type script. I guess nobody said this. And so we had it all lettered from his pencil lettering, pencil writing. And then I had to go through and erase a ton of Stephen King handwriting in order to clean the pages up around the edges. It just killed me. <laughs> it just killed me. So there are a few pages where you can see a little penciled, half a penciled line up top or a few couple penciled lines at the bottom where it was far enough away from the art, I felt I could let it slide and it wouldn't disappear. I mean, it wouldn't show up in the printed version, but it was just, it was just, it was terrible. But I actually did a great job with it and it was a lot of fun to do. And I have to say, I've just seen this for the first time today, uh, I saw it this morning, and I'm, I could not be more delighted with the reproduction. The first page especially where I did some gesso and some textural stuff, it looks like the original page. You have, to, you have to actually touch it to realize it's not the page that I actually drew. It was very cool, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have this out. <coughs> and uh, as the editor of these books, I can't tell you how much I uh, look forward to hearing an artist say that it looks like the original art, because that's what I always live in dread of, someone saying, oh, this looks really crap, but uh, luckily Walter liked it. Uh, this is a book that will be coming out in August. It is a uh, artist edition of Marvel covers, classic Marvel covers by 30 different artists and a number of inkers as well. Um, on the left we have you know, really a classic Jack Kirby cover, and we have you know, a, fair, a fair selection of covers by Mr. Kirby, and then uh, a Steranko cover, which we have several of also. And then... Getting back to Walter, I got to say this particular book is something that I've um, really been looking forward to. Uh, Manhunter, uh, as probably everybody in the world knows by now, is one of my all-time favorite things. Um, and when I was when I was a kid, I had three favorite comics. I had a lot of different favorite comics, but there were three that were the, my real favorite favorites. Uh, Manhunter. Uh, Joe Kubert's Tarzan, and another one that uh, I won't mention right now. Um, but so, so far I've gotten to do two out of my three absolute favorite comics when I was 10 years old, and there's no bigger thrill. Um, and I'm going to be doing the third one sometime next year, and I'll let you guys stew on that. That piece over there on the right, uh, actually Walter just did that for fun, and that just kills me. What a beautiful little piece of work. It's on duo shade, right, Walter? That's right. <coughs> duo shade, for those of you who don't know, is a paper that was used in, uh, in cartooning in the 30s and 40s and 50s, not so much now. Um, and they basically, there are two patterns in the paper. You can see them, they're very light, they don't show up if you photograph it. I mean, in scanning, you'd get them, but in the old days, photostats and photographic, they wouldn't show up, so they were essentially invisible. And you would draw on the paper, and then you would want to shade like a guy's face, like lighting or clouds in the sky. And you had two little bottles of liquid that would look like water. They were, they had the same consistency of water. But they were chemicals. You would dip your brush in one of them, and you'd run it over the paper. And of these two patterns, let's say a hash like that, one of them would come up. And so you would get a gray tone in that pattern. But you could do it with a brush. You wouldn't have to cut the film with an X-Acto blade or anything. You could draw with a brush and get this pattern. And if you use the other liquid, both patterns would come up. So what you were essentially given was a page which you had white, you had two shades of gray, one light, one dark, and you had black. And uh, uh, Roy Crane, who did the Buzz Sawyer newspaper strip for many years, and also Wally Wood are two guys, Wallace Wood, who did Mad Magazine and a lot of other stuff, are two guys I can think of who are absolutely masters of using this. They could use this stuff, and you would have sworn, maybe especially Wally, Woody, that he was doing more than just two shades and white and black. It just looked like it was a, a rich palette of gray. They're really beautiful. I don't claim that for this. But that's what this was done. This was on that kind of duo <coughs> shade paper. So the pattern that you see, those two, there's a light gray and a dark gray, essentially. They have a little bit of red tone to them, a little brown tone. In black and white, 
reproduction, that doesn't show up. They just come out as black and you know, a black line but with white spaces between them. So you get different gray shades. And that's what that was done with. And I just I was just goofing around really. I had some do a shade paper. I didn't use it very often in my own professional work. But I the nice part about stuff like this, if you screw it up, you throw the drawing away, nobody ever sees it again and you're not embarrassed by it. If you get it if you get it in print somewhere, it's out there forever. And this will be out there forever, but I'm okay with the drawing, so it worked out all right. And uh, if you want to see an example of what Walter was talking about, if you pick, a, pick up a copy of the Wallywood EC Artist Edition, uh, there are plenty of stories that just have amazing use of, of uh, duo shade as well as all other crazy techniques. I mean, there's one, I'm, I'm gonna, I don't want to derail this panel, but there was one story where Wood, it was called um, Mars's Heaven. I remember there's one page where he has four different types of paper that he would cut out holes and put it in from the back. Uh, duo shade, scratch board, uh, grease pencil, and something else. But uh, just remarkable amount of work. Uh, and then next we have the John Buscema Silver Surfer book, which I know, uh, where's Brian Peck? Oh, there he is. That's the guy who's really looking forward to this book. Me too. Um, John Buscema, obviously one of the classic Marvel artists from the uh, 1960s. Uh, this book will have uh, a couple of different Silver Surfer stories, the large 40 pagers, uh, as well as some other nice material. These are a couple of pages that uh, aren't part of the complete stories, but a couple of pages that will be in the book, the origin sequence. And then that brings us to Will Eisner's Spirit, Volume 2. Uh, which, uh, you know, what can I say? You can't go wrong with Will Eisner. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, here's a book that I am also very, very excited about, and that is <laughs> Enemy Ace by Joe Kubert. <laughs> and, you know, we've, uh, we've done a few. This will be our third Joe Kubert book, and I, uh, I'll be a happy man if I can keep on publishing Joe Kubert stuff. As a, an example of just the tremendous double page spread. This guy, what an artist. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, my favorite so far out of all the books you've done is the, is the Joe Kubert tour book. I don't know if anybody's got that. But I, I look at that and the drawing is masterful, but effortless. It's like somebody whistling a tune. It's just incredible. And, and, and look at that, look at the brush strokes on Enemy Ace's collar. Look at the size of those. But they just bang in there with absolute, absolute certainty and ease. Just astounding stuff. If you're an aspiring artist, you know, just spend, <coughs> spend a month with, with one of those books. That's how to draw. Or, or never look at these books again. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the thing about Joe Kubert is, or was, he was, he was fearless. You know, he would, he would, you know, it was art, no doubt, but it was a job. And it was a job that had deadlines and he had to get it done and he wasn't precious about it. When we were working on the Tarzan book, which he told me, by the way, was the fav his favorite thing that he had ever done. And I agreed with that personally. But there was, um, um, we needed to take out for the cover, not we kept it on the inside, but on the cover we took out the DC logo that was on the art for the cover of the book. And I, I mentioned that to, uh, Pete Carlson, who was Joe's right-hand man at the Kubert School, and Pete said, "Oh, let me just let me talk to Joe, and you know, we'll, he'll do a patch." And so he transfers the phone, and I'm on the phone with Joe and Pete on the speakerphone, and we're talking about it. And while we're on the phone, he does the patch. <laughs> I sent him, I sent him a uh, a scan, and he literally just took a piece of tracing paper and he just did it, and then s sent it to us. Pete scanned it, sent it to us, and. Uh, you know, we had uh, we had our cover. All right, now we are at the end of things that have already been talked about. So, the two announcements that we are doing. Uh, the first one is something is by an artist who we have done an artist edition of before. Second one is a new artist. Uh, the first one is by the King of Comics. And did somebody say who? 
And <laughs> um, this particular book will have seven complete issues, including issues two, three, and then five through nine, which is really, you know, prime prime time material. And then the final announcement, the the final announcement in the presentation is by an incredibly talented artist who has won four or five Eisner Awards, including an Eisner Award for this particular book that uh, we are about to present. And actually, the writer artist is here with us right now, and that is Mr. Eric Powell. And, you know, I'll, I'll let Eric say a few words, um, but I just wanted to say how happy I am. I mean, what I love about Artist Editions is it's all sorts of different styles, all sorts of different books, and I think the one common denominator is it's all great work. You know, I think every single book, to me, is by an incredibly talented creator, and, and Eric certainly... Um, falls into that category. And, you know, this particular book is, you know, just gorgeous. I was looking at all the originals uh, a few days ago in my office that uh, Eric was kind enough to bring out so we could scan them. And the work is just phenomenal. And, and um, once again, even, you know, even in this day and age where we have great printing, I'm always shocked at how much better the originals look than, than they're printed. <laughs> but uh, Eric, I'll turn it over to you if you want to say a couple words. Um, really happy that to, to, to be in this group of amazing books that you guys are putting out, for one. Um, Chinatown uh, is one of the few things that I actually, I colored it digitally myself, but I think I put, uh, the work I put into the actual pages, the, the coloring actually kind of detracts a little bit. Uh, I did so much uh, gray tone and stuff on the pages that when I layered color in there, and I laid it in really light. I didn't want to, you know, have a really saturated book. I wanted it to look a little washed out, but I think it actually detracts a little bit. And the, the originals definitely look better, I think, than the, the printed material. Um, and that's okay for me to say because I actually did the <laughs> colors. And I can critique myself and not put someone else down or something. Else, so. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to, to have this coming out. And we are too. Definitely. None of this can happen without Scott Doombeer. So uh, if, if you guys wouldn't mind a little round of applause for <laughs> the editor of all these books. And, um, you know, editor, it, let me explain. For those of you that are not familiar with the typical comic book editor, the writer and artist sends the material to the editor and the editor gets to edit it. In addition to that piece of the equation for Scott here, he is the Sherlock Holmes of our industry. He has to go out and <laughs> find the art. Um, in, in the case of two of the gentlemen up here, that is a little easier because Walter keeps most of his artwork. Eric's got all the art from Chinatown, I assume. You hadn't given any pages away, right? No. Okay. Um, uh, Dave, on the other hand, did not keep Watchmen, um, uh, except I assume a few pages that were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, sorry. No, 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 even a few pages. Oh, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry for bringing yeah, that up. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point is, it's not like these are all in some nice library or museum, and we, you know, we just go and we kind of cherry pick what we like. This is an amazing undertaking in, in which Scott really is playing private detective and forensic scientist and, and really playing an interesting game of telephone where 20 years ago, when he was an art dealer, he says, you know, let me call a guy who I think used to own a couple of those pages. And he finds the guy living in Europe somewhere. And that guy says, no, I sold those years ago, but let me tell you who I sold it to. And 12 phone calls and three emails later, somehow we track down the art. And I say, we, I mean Scott. And I, I, we're really, we're so fortunate to be able to do, like I said, I, I keep losing count because the books are, sometimes the books come out in a flurry of activity, but I believe Dave's is book number 21. Um, and we only started this business four years ago, and it took us a year between book one and book two, um, you know, because we wanted to see, you know, were you going to be interested in these artist editions? And um, 
you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly grateful. Uh, for me, it's also an education in terms of <laughs> when you track this material down. So, uh, all right, away we go. What is the piece of artwork? Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to jump in one more thing here. Okay. This is kind of for Greg, but I will also say that the idea for RS Editions, whatever they were going to be called, was really something that Scott had thought about for a long time because he and I would have discussions about this years before the first one came out. And he's worked several different places, and I will say it this to IEW's credit, and they're paying me, but it's okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an independent <laughs> observer, but they were the guys that decided to take a flyer on Scott's idea, which a lot of other publishers had not. So I think that IEW deserves some credit as well for getting these things out there, and now the measure of its success is that other publishers are starting to do the same thing, which cracks me up, but I'm delighted. <laughs> uh, and, and every time those other publishers start a book, they usually call Walter, so of course you're delighted. <laughs> <laughs> well. All right, that being said, Scott, uh, what is the piece of original artwork that we will have to pry from your dead cold hands? That's a tough question. Um, you know, probably, probably two, two things. <laughs> uh, one is a, um, a drawing of Captain America that Jack Kirby did for me when I was a kid. Uh, I was uh, uh, probably 16 years old. Um, I, I called him up. Uh, someone at a local comic shop told me he had a listed phone number. So I called him up. Yeah, no, really. <laughs> I was at a comic book shop. We were living in uh, Woodland Hills, California when I was 16. And uh, I went to this uh, comic shop. And I, I remember I had a bunch of different Jack Kirby comics. And the guy behind the counter, who was very astute, said, oh, do you like Jack Kirby? And I said, well, yes, I do. And he says, you know, he has a listed phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I needed to hear. So I called up directory assistance when I got back home. Mm -hmm. And I was... Oh, wait a second. Do we have an update? Watchmen books are in the building. Okay. <laughs> and so, and so um, I called up and I, we had a 20 minute conversation and he was just the nicest guy. And after the, after we were done talking, he said, I told him we lived in Woodland Hills, and he said, why don't you get your mom to bring you up here this weekend? I'll sign some comics for you, and you know, we can have lunch. And so, <laughs> didn't have to tell me twice. <laughs> and can you do it next, the weekend after, Mr. Kirby? Um, and so my mom, God bless her, uh, she drove me up there. And I remember I brought, if you've heard this story before, I've told it a few times, sorry. Um, I brought much too big a stack. I brought like 50 comics. And I remember when I was taking them out of like the supermarket bag they were in, I remember Roz, Jack's wife, looking at them and rolling her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't understand why until years <laughs> later. But uh, uh, Jack opened up every single cover and signed on the first page of every single one of them. And then we uh, had a nice lunch. My mom was in the kitchen with uh, Roz smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. And uh, and then when we were ready to leave, he gave me uh, that God's portfolio and he did this uh, drawing of Captain America waving saying, hi, Scott. So mm -hmm. that's one of them. The other two, it's two pages. It's, it's, it's a sequence. Um, and actually, you'll, you'll probably see these, actually, you will see these in the uh, Will Eisner spirit book now that we're going to put some Wally Wood pages in which I have to clear with Dennis. Um, I have a two-page sequence from the first episode. It's actually before they go into outer space. But I remember reading this when I was, I mean, obviously I didn't read this in the, in the 1950s when it came out, at least I hope it's obvious. Um, but I remember when I first read this story, you know, this particular two-page sequence really struck me. It's, and it's besides beautiful art by Wally Wood, Wally Wood also lettered it. Uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous lettering. And the sequence is this old scientist who comes to the spirit to try to get him to lead this mission to the moon. And the spirit is telling him 
why this isn't a good idea, that he has no experience, that he's been shot up plenty, that he's too old, he might not be able to take the rigors of such a mission. And the old scientist just says, I know, I know, you know, implying, but I still want you to go. And finally at the end, there's this one part where the spirit starts talking about, hang on one second. Hello? We've lost him again. <laughs> yes? Is that Kathy? Hi, Kathy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually in the middle of a panel. Okay, but you're sending the proofs for tomorrow, right? That's right. Is that good? The uh, Hilton gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. That's the proof for the Manhunter, Walter Simonson Manhunter Artist Edition. Um, so in this sequence, the spirit just starts talking about life. And he says, you know, doctor, a man gets tired. He starts th thinking about settling down, raising a family, getting married. And behind him is Ellen Dolan, his longtime girlfriend, and her father, Commissioner Dolan. And Wood did this amazing sequence where two panels, after the spirit says that, there's two different shots of him, and they're silent panels, which you know, today, God knows that'll never happen. Um, and finally, the spirit just says, all right, I'll go. And Wood did this amazing strobe effect of Ellen burying her head in her father's shoulder. And those are two of my all-time favorite pages. And I actually tracked those down one at a time. I was looking for them for years, and I just got lucky. One was here at San Diego, and another one a friend of mine turned up. Um, but so those are probably the, the ones. Can I, just, uh, can I just tell my story about my piece yeah, of yeah, art? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, actually, I was going to go in that direction anyway. Prize smoke. It's just uh, Scott was talking about Jack Kirby. I'll, I'll, ch I'll try and keep this brief, but we're when I was a kid growing up in England in the 50s, you used to get black and white reprints of American comics, and they were very few and far between and a bit sparse, and you didn't know what you were going to get next. But my favorite, favorite comic, because I love science fiction, is called Race for the Moon. And it was only three issues. It was a Harvey comic, and then there was a thing called The Three Rocketeers that, that used up the rest of the material later. And I've got this vivid, vivid memory of being at primary school, being about eight years old, and the teacher said, okay, class, today, you can paint whatever you like in art. So people started doing racing cars and footballers or ballerinas and horses. And, and she came over to me and she said, oh, this is interesting, David. What, what's this? I said, oh, it's a man um, in a spacesuit and he's been manacled to an asteroid and left to die. <laughs> 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 so she said, oh, that, that, that's very interesting, David. <laughs> Uh, and that, in fact, was my recreation of this splash page of a story called Space Garbage, which was a guy manacled to an asteroid, draw, drawn by Jack Kirby, inked by Al Williamson, and that combination is absolutely magical, the, the power of Kirby and the grace and the, the, the kind of textural sense of, of Al Williamson. And I eventually tracked down all the copies of Race for the Moon. I got all the American originals that were in color. Then eventually, Titan Books in England we're going to do the Simon and Kirby archive. Uh, and I said, oh, you must do the science fiction. There's some great science fiction stuff, and you must let me write the foreword. So I wrote the foreword and sort of recounted more or less the story I've told you. And then Steve Sackle, the editor, phoned me up and said, hey, Dave, you know, now that they've reshot all this artwork that's been in Joe Simon's file drawer since the 1950s, now they've shot it all, they're auctioning it, they're selling it off. So I phoned up the guy who sells my original artwork and said, Joe, you owe me quite a bit of money. I said, I want you to, to bid up to the limit of everything you owe me <laughs> and get me that, <laughs> that Jack Kirby job. And he did. He went on Heritage, and he got the entire five-page job. <laughs> and, you know, no, number one, I really can't believe that those pages still exist from the 50s. We're talking about 60 years ago. Um, and the fact that I own one of them is just this kid in England who loved American comics, how did he ever get to the stage of actually owning his favorite panel of all time? So I've just had it framed in its beautiful 1950s twice up art. The thing that, that was amazing, this is what you get from looking at the original art, it's beautifully drawn. In fact, there's a terrible error on it. It's not been, been <laughs> corrected. 
Williamson, when he was in from like a gloved hand, obviously smudged it, and there's a big white smudge across <laughs> the face. And I've looked at that a thousand times, and I never saw it until I had the original artwork. So that's the piece that you never get away from me. Well, uh, apparently the, the footnote to that story is apparently, and this is sad for both of us, is that I was bidding against you on those <laughs> pieces. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. He, he cost you a lot yeah, of money. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but you, must, but you must admit, I'm the one who deserves to own Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, right. You, you, you re they, they are. They were beautiful, and, and I agree with you. The combination of Kirby and Williamson, which is obviously a fairly rare combination, mm. but uh, just you're right. Mm. You can you can look it up. A, a bunch of Dave Gibbons artwork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Okay. So, um, oh, I actually. If you don't, do you want a follow-up question to that? Okay. Back in the um, back in the uh, early early '90s, uh, I, I was a member of this thing called uh, an APA, and an APA is a amateur press association. And are you a member of that, Brian? No, but you know it. Yeah. Well, an APA, for those of you who don't know, is a magazine for lunatics. <laughs> it is. I'm not kidding. It is literally. There, there are 40 or 50 members, and each one does an entry. They write an article about one particular topic. And then all you, you make 60 copies, and you send it to a central collator, who then puts it all together and sends them out to all the members. So you have a 300-page you know, handmade book at the end of the day. And this particular, this particular issue was um, on Neil Adams. <coughs> and I used to have a pretty fairly fair-sized Neil Adams collection, and so I did an interview with Neil for the for the issue. But I also wanted to uh, make a nice presentation of uh, of my original art. Um, but I had a lot of pencil work, and I started making photocopies, and they just looked like crap. You know, they looked really horrible, and so I I started making color copies, and they look great. And I wound up, um, I wound up making literally hundreds of color photocopies in the 1990s. Think about how much color copies cost back then. It <laughs> was not the brightest move, but it looked so much better. And so that's sort of what I consider my first artist edition. Um, you know, and it really is, you know, I, I mean, I think genius is a little bit too kind. I think it's a just an idea that, uh, you know, once it hits you, if you act upon it, that's all. So one, of the, one of the things that applies to all archival projects, particularly for artist editions, is the technology has finally caught up to the great ideas. And, and the reality is, you know, I, I think about what it was like to scan artwork, you know, even 15, 20 years ago, and what the processes was and what the expense was to actually get that done, um, and, and then to actually print large size books, the, the, the large, the oversized art editions are what size dimensions again? They're 15 by 22 inches. 15 by 22 inches. I mean, they're still, to this day, are only a few bindries in the world, not in the country, in the world that can do that, that kind of quality, and do it at a price so that we do not have to charge $300 for an artist and edition. And the size of a big baby. <laughs> <laughs> they weigh more than a big baby. Yeah, every year I threaten to do a special deal with IKEA where we're going to make artist edition bookcases <laughs> every year, and one of these and one of these days I'm going to announce that that here. So um, one or two more questions for the panel, and then I'll take questions from the audience, and we'll do the we'll do the giveaway. So real, we got less than fifteen. All right, then I'm going to.
So, so I have a, so I have a question. I, I have a question. I'll, I'll throw at Walter. It's a, it applies to everyone. What was the first piece of original comic book art you ever saw, and you understood what the form was? Do you remember it all? Uh, the only thing I can say about that for sure, I was a, the first convention I ever went to. I was never a comic in comics fandom, but I was in science fiction fandom at the end of the '60s and at the early '70s, and so. I was, my first convention was the World Science Fiction Convention in 1969 in St. Louis. Uh, I went there, I, I was wowed by everything, it was enormous. Not like this now, but for a kid never been to a convention, it was huge. And there was a, an art dealer there, and he had a page, I don't know which one now, but he had a page of Joe Kubert's, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't Hawkman, it, oh, Viking Prince for sale for 40 bucks. Now. It might have well have been a million dollars to me in 1969. But I remember seeing it, and it, I don't know if it was the first page of art I ever actually saw. It might very well have been. I didn't, you know, there weren't conventions back then. I didn't really go to anything. I didn't know anybody else who read comics like I did. And so probably the first page was some page of the Viking prints that I saw on a dealer's you know, wall at, in uh, St. Louis. Yep. Can I just uh, jump in again? Yeah, I actually, I can't remember which was the first piece of original art I saw, but the way that I broke into comics was by doing balloon lettering. And in Britain, comics weren't done in quite the same production line ways as over here, that you would actually letter on the pencil drawings before it was inked. You know, the artist would draw the whole thing complete and maybe leave a space for a balloon or not. So you then had to do it on sticky paper and stick it on there and draw around it and draw the tail. But that meant that every week, I would get like a dozen pages of assorted art from maybe humor artists, serious adventure artists, and I could study it. I mean, I could do the lettering quite quickly, but I'd study it and you'd think, oh, he drew that with a brush, or oh, he blacked that all in and then got white paint and went back. And it was a tremendous learning process for me. And the, the reproduction quality is so good in these IDW exhibitions that they serve the same <coughs> purpose as that. If you're, a, uh, if you're a, a, a wannabe artist or an established artist, Look at them, and you'll be able to get so much out of them. You'll be able to see so much in the way of technique and process that they're really valuable apart from just being beautiful objects. So, Eric, yeah. do you remember the first piece of original art you saw? I think I do. I think this is the first piece. I'm pretty sure. Um, I grew up in rural. Just say it is. We yeah, it is. It's totally <laughs> first. Now, um, I grew up in, in rural Tennessee, so comic conventions and stores were pretty much, you know, on the moon as far as I was concerned. Um, but one time. <coughs> I remember my, my sister's boyfriend at the time took me to uh, somebody decided to put on a comic book convention in Nashville and some guy, I don't even remember his name, I don't think he works in comics anymore, but he was an inker for uh, a DC book. And I was like, oh my God, it's somebody who actually makes a comic book. And I thought that, you know, the people drew the panels individually and then someone put them together or something like that. And um, so I went there and I brought a little portfolio of stuff and and uh, I, I remember seeing his pages and, and just being like, oh, you know, like just being blown away. I mean, it was, I'm sure, I, it, I can't even remember what the book was, so I'm sure it wasn't anything spectacular, but it was, an, it was so far beyond anything I had, had ever been put in front of me before. And uh, I remember showing him my stuff. I mean, you, do you think I have a chance to ever work in comics? He just said, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. That was just one word response, and I was like, oh. <laughs> How old were you? I was maybe 14, 15, and something now like that. You have the last. And now <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. oh, that's great. See, I, th I have a story that I really want to tell, but I can't tell because one of the members on the panel is very, very close friends with the person who this is about, and I think that I think you know who that person might be. <laughs> I, I, and I, I, I want no. I'll just I'll just say there was there was an artist who um, made a friend of mine cry when he was 13 years old, but um, I won't mention the artist. <laughs> okay, um, this this gentleman had a question. I
Keith Carlson told me that um, that uh, Joe, um, he was in the hospital and he was going to get out and then he didn't. And but Pete said to me, but don't worry, you know, he's still working on those sketches. And I went, Joe, for the love of God, or Pete, for the love of God, tell him to stop drawing those stupid sketches. It, it doesn't matter. And Pete just says, you tell Joe Kubert not to draw. <laughs> 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 you know, and and you know, I'm I'm sad that he never got a chance to see the book. But Joe saw, um, you know, every PDF uh, from, you know, he approved it. Um, so he saw everything but the printed book and. He was very happy about it. I mean, I remember when I told him that we were going to be doing it, we had actually signed the deal to do the tour book first, and um, then I, I had been trying to uh, work something out with Edgar Rice Burroughs people, and uh, I remember when I called him up after we had made the deal, I called him up, and I, I told him, I said, Joe, we're going to be able to do Tarzan, and his voice sounded, and, and Joe Kubert was a very nice guy, but he was kind of gruff. You know, just a little bit, and but I remember when I told him that his voice sounded like sunshine. You know, he just sounded so happy because again, he said that was his favorite thing that he ever did. 